Welcome to Words on Air. I'm your host, Lindsay Smith. Today our guest is Mary Catherine Nagel. Mary Catherine Nagel is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and a partner at the law firm, Pipestem Law Firm, which specializes in tribal sovereignty. She's also the director of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. So tell me why lawyers make such good writers. <laughs> uh, well, I, mean, I think there are some lawyers that are very bad writers, but hopefully <laughs> if you're a lawyer, you're a good writer. Yeah. Um, I think the best lawyers are good storytellers. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to tell a story, you're probably not going to win very many cases as a lawyer because at the end of the day, Law is about rules, but those rules have been crafted based on stories or narratives that we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. So you think about any major decision the Supreme Court has made, right? There's a story yeah. behind that case. And um, I think oftentimes the cases where people see, oh, the law just wasn't fair, it didn't come out the right way, it's because the story that was told was either slanted one way or the mm -hmm. other, and, and story is everything in the law. Mm. So I want to ask you a little more about your play, Sovereignty, which premiered earlier this year. Um, in that play, there are three court cases that are sort of the focus of the action of the play. So we have Worcester versus Georgia, mm -hmm. Oliphant versus Suquamish Indian Tribe, and then the Violence Against Women Act, also known as VAWA. So why were those three cases the stuff of drama for you? Uh, well, if you think about it, <laughs> I, I think the drama to me is so deeply personal that it's mm -hmm. hard for me to understand how it couldn't be dramatic. Uh, I mean, it resulted in my great, great, great grandfather being stabbed to death 46 times in front of his wife and children. So that's, it's pretty dramatic. Um, You're talking about Ridge, right? Mm -hmm. tell, okay. So again, you know, Supreme Court cases, any court case is about a conflict and inherently in conflict, there is drama. Um, we can debate, you know, what conflicts are more interesting or more dramatic, but it's mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I think the Supreme Court's decision in Wooster came at a time when, you know, the President of the United States had just run for president on a platform of completely eradicating tribal nations. Mm -hmm. And my grandfathers were fighting alongside Principal Chief John Ross to prevent the, the extermination and removal of their nation, but also other nations in the Southeast. And they won. They won this huge case. It was a huge victory, unprecedented. And then, of course, the President of the United States refused to enforce it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's incredibly dramatic. So far, it seems like the audiences that have seen it agree mm -hmm. that it is uh, worthy of being told on the stage. Oliphant, I think, is equally dramatic. You've got um, a white guy who shows up on a reservation, gets really drunk, physically assaults a tribal police officer, and another officer shows up on the scene to arrest him, and he goes off in a high, um, a high speed chase in his car and crashes into another cop car, and thankfully no one was injured in that crash. So, you know, I mean, that's the, that's the making of movies, right? Like mm -hmm. lots of movies are made in Hollywood that involve high speed chases. And so uh -huh. um, you don't have to dig very deep to see the drama inherent in these cases. And of course, in Oliphant, that was the case where the United States Supreme Court said tribal nations can no longer exercise mm -hmm. criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who come onto tribal lands and commit crimes. Mm -hmm. And because of that case, we have more drama in our communities and in our lives today because our nations have been stripped mm -hmm. of their inherent jurisdiction to prosecute the majority of the people committing crimes against their women and children. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think those two cases in particular are pr very dramatic, and I think that um, you know the VAWA case is hypothetical. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, I think it will at some point. A non-Indian will challenge the constitutionality of VAWA's restored criminal jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and so in my play, I'm hypothesizing about how that might play out. So then, this question of jurisdiction, um, non-native and native prosecution, or uh, um, the applicability of tribal jurisdiction to natives and non-natives. Um, this question of jurisdiction is the key piece then of sovereignty, which is where the title comes from. So um, though this is so um, important for our communities here in Oklahoma, I'll bet a lot of the folks watching don't know how this applies here. So you wanna fill us in a little bit about how sovereignty works in Oklahoma, maybe particularly sure. according uh, we to have, jurisdiction? We have 39 tribal nations here mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. Um, 
the majority of which, to my knowledge, were here before Oklahoma became a state. Mm -hmm. Of course, before that, you have tribes like um, the Wichita and Caddo mm -hmm. and Osage Nation who were at one time, you know, and I could, and I'm not the expert on this, but and I'm, everyone disagrees about which tribes were here over right. uh, the last th several thousands of years. But uh, obviously, um, you know, my grandfather signed the Treaty of New Echota, which, mm -hmm. um, in which Cherokee Nation sold the lands in the east for specific lands in what is now Oklahoma. But, you know, it was Indian territory from, you know, the 1800s up to 1906 when Oklahoma became a state. Um, when Oklahoma became a state, the Congress passed a series of laws to essentially strip tribal nations of their sovereignty and give, you know, sort of create this sovereignty for the state of Oklahoma. Those efforts uh, were successful in some parts and failed in others. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the federal government tried to outlaw our courts. I mean, literally, they were passing laws saying our courts were illegal, um, trying to outlaw our governments and trying to diminish our citizenship and our sovereign nations based on blood quantum. Mm -hmm. And I would say ultimately those efforts failed. They have caused great harm to our nations and our citizens, um, but we're still here. Mm -hmm. We, Our court that actually my great, 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 great grandfather started in 1825, the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court, still exists today. We have laws, we have sovereignty, we have jurisdiction. The reality is um, our jurisdiction, because of the last couple hundreds of years, and in particular the Supreme Court's decision in Oliphant, have taken bits and pieces of our jurisdiction away. Mm -hmm. Today, I think we're... We're at a very exciting moment. I got to be at the VAWA signing ceremony on March 7th, 2013. So I got to watch the President of the United States sign the Violence Against Women Act into law. And that law reauthorizes or restores tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who come onto tribal lands and commit crimes of domestic violence, dating violence, and violation of protection orders. Mm -hmm. So for the first time in United States history, instead of the United States trying to take away a piece of our sovereignty or jurisdiction, they're restoring a piece of what has been taken away. Mm -hmm. And what an exciting time to live in because yeah. I just think about my parents and my grandparents and, and every generation to come before us has been fighting against losing more. Mm -hmm. And we're now the generation that gets to work on restoring. Mm -hmm. Not to say that we won't still lose some of our battles because right. you know there's a battle going before the Supreme Court right now. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the Creek Nation case, but in the, just this last summer, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals declared that the Creek Nation's reservation has never been disestablished. Mm -hmm. That's now going up to the United States Supreme Court. Huge implications right. for tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction. And the state of Oklahoma right. is arguing that Creek Nation should no longer have a reservation, mm -hmm. even though they've signed treaties with mm -hmm. the United States, which we know under, under the Constitution, once ratified by the Senate, signed by the president under our constitution they're the supreme law of the land of course the state of oklahoma is arguing that those treaties should no longer apply mm -hmm. that and the creek nation should no longer have a reservation and um and of course i'm sure they would say their arguments a bit more nuanced than that but um these are you know the questions around sovereignty and jurisdiction here in oklahoma are very alive and real right, right. and very different for each tribe sure um it's not a one-size-fits-all and different from Oklahoma than from other places exactly. in North America, Exactly. I mean, too. you know, and uh, I mean, every state in the United States had tribal nations mm -hmm. at one point, even if they don't today. Right. You know, so sometimes I'll be in Pennsylvania or something and someone will say, there are no tribes here. And I'm yeah. like, well, <laughs> you know, I know the Lenape were here at one point. Yeah. You all moved them forcibly. <laughs> but, um, right. so, you know, so, but then, and then for the states that do have a large number of tribes like Oklahoma, um, you know, the, the legality of the interaction between the state government and the tribal nation government, governments and the United States government is different. And there's all these laws. I mean, I could, you know, attorneys, I mean, I could talk about PL 280 and the right. allotment acts and Indian country status. And you could give like a six hour lecture and still not be able to reach all the different hypotheticals right. of well, but if it's this given set mm -hmm. of facts, then this is who has jurisdiction. Right. And that's a legal framework largely created by Congress and the United States Supreme Court. Right. So it's not inherent to our fabric of who we are. It's, right. It's a narrative. It's a story we've adopted. And, right. Um, I, would, I would hope that, that we can work on restoring 
tribal jurisdiction and sovereignty as, as much as possible. Right. Well, you mentioned your family and just how personal these questions of jurisdiction are for you. So what's it been like as you've staged these plays outside of Oklahoma with all kinds of new audiences to see a lot, a lot of your family history on stage and see the reaction? Uh, it's been really powerful. Yeah. And very affirming to see um, mostly non-natives, but also natives mm -hmm. around the country um, see my version of my family on stage, right? Like I'm, it's, it's me writing them. So, uh -huh. um, and, and see them adhering to the words that my grandfather said, mm -hmm. feeling the emotion and feeling my family's loss because we have had a lot of loss and that's been really emotional and I think also healing. And I think any family that comes from trauma and so many of our families do, um, deserves that opportunity to share their story and heal. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's, it's been very powerful. So your play, Manahata, is premiering at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival mm -hmm. as well. Do you want to fill us in a little bit about what that's yes, about? Yes, I actually fly back there tomorrow, so I'm really excited because I, I haven't seen it since it opened, but I'm hearing wonderful things from the theater is very happy with it, and I think tickets have been selling very well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a play about the Delaware Lenape. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the Delaware Nation here mm -hmm. in Bartlesville, and the, I'm sorry, the Delaware Nation in Anadarko and the Delaware Tribe in Bartlesville. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both Delaware Lenape. They just got separated over there. Yeah. Hundreds of years of broken treaties. And, um, you know, the play follows the story of a young woman named Jane Snake. Jane Snake is a citizen of the Delaware Nation in Anadarko, and she gets a job at Lehman Brothers and returns to work on Wall Street. Right. The street named after the wall that the Dutch built in 1654 to forcibly remove her people from their homeland. So it's a story of homecoming. Mm -hmm. It's a story of crisis of consciousness, of like, what does it mean to be a young, successful native person, mm -hmm. leaving home and going out in the world to make it? When you shatter that glass ceiling, are you, you know, just cutting yourself everywhere or are you really <laughs> achieving something for your people? Like, yeah. you know, are you, um, when are you a sellout and when are you a, achieving an unprecedented victory for your people? And I think that um, there's a lot more to it than that too, but it also recounts the historical purchase of Manhattan Island when the Dutch purchased the entire island for $24 in 1626. So... Well, um, you've had an opportunity now also traveling and speaking to other young people interested in writing and in theater. Um, you've had a chance to talk about what this kind of work, what this drama does for the future of Native writing. And you've used this hashtag oh. instead of red face. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that movement. Well, I was living in New York, writing plays, and I didn't see a single theater. I lived there for five years. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a single theater while I lived there produce a play by a Native playwright, except for Amerinda, uh, which is a Native theater company. But I mean, I'm t in terms of professional, non-Native, mainstream theaters, mm -hmm. none of them would produce Native plays. I did see several performances of Red Face, which is where a non-Indian gets up on stage and puts makeup and feathers on. And sometimes they try to do a more, I would say, more authentic. It's never authentic. Red Face is, a, you know, a misrepresentation. But sometimes it was just a straight out offense, right? Like they're mm -hmm. walking around with a whiskey bottle, grunting, making, dehumanizing us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I found that very problematic. And I, the theaters I would talk to, I'd say, why are you doing red face? I, I find it so problematic. And they'd say, well, we don't censor. The artist really thought this was hilarious. We're making fun of people who don't like Indians. And I'm like, really? You're, mm -hmm. okay, you're taking a performance that originated at the time of the Indian Removal Act in the early 1800s to support the creation of a culture that would dehumanize us and support genocide. And now you think when you perform that same performance, it's a joke against the people who made it? How is that possible? Mm. Um, yeah, so that would be the conversation I have. But then it, I would always try to take it to, well, name me one Native playwright your theaters produced, and they couldn't name a single one. Mm. So that was my problem with, you know, and again, theaters in New York, I, we could go on for hours, but, mm. you know, if, okay, we're going to disagree about the artistic merit and value of Red Face. I think it's a dehumanizing political tool. I don't think it's very has a lot of artistic merit. Mm -hmm. um, but whether or not what we think of its artistic merit, I think we can certainly agree there's a high artistic merit that if you're going to offer an unauthentic misrepresentation, you should also offer an authentic representation right. and let the audience 
compare the two and let that let those pieces of art be in dialogue with one another. Right. So what does it mean to do red face but exclude simultaneously native voices? And that's what a lot of theaters still to this day are doing in New York and across mm -hmm. this country. And so I would challenge them, I'd say, just produce one native writer, just one, just mm -hmm. do one, just start with one. And the response would be like, well, we just don't know any. And it drove me crazy. So yeah. I just created this hashtag, hashtag instead of red face. And I told all my native artist friends, just tweet with it, post on Facebook with it, put on Instagram. So when someone says to me, I just don't know any native writers, I say, hmm, go look at hashtag instead of red face. You will see a lot. Yeah. And you'll see Vicky Ramirez, you'll see Delena Studi, you'll see Reed Bobroff, Dylan Chito, Randy Reinholz, Larissa Fasthorse. I, you know, I could sit here and name for on and on and on and on and on, right? The writers who are putting their own work and other people's work up at hashtag yeah. instead of redface. And so, yeah, I, I'm thrilled that it's taken off. And I think now it stands as um, an example that there really are no more excuses for simply right. not producing native work. Right. So how can we advocate for writers <laughs> like yourself here at home? In oh, thank you. I, we have a lot of great writers here in the yeah. state. We have Carolyn Dunn, who is an, who actually, whose uh, plays are getting workshopped uh, in Los Angeles this next month in June. She's right. a native writer here in Oklahoma. We have Aragon Starr, who's yeah. in the Tulsa Artist Fellowship. We have Sterling Harjo. We have Ryan Redcorn. We have Russ Tallchief. Um, so I think, you know, local theaters, local arts organizations, produce a play by a native playwright yeah. or contact me. I'm happy to collaborate. Let's do a native writer festival. Like let's yeah. do a public reading of five native plays from Oklahoma native writers. I mean, there's so much that's possible. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's just about um, collaborations. Yeah. And, and, I, and I really do, I, I'm so grateful. You know, I, we served together for the, on the committee for mm -hmm. the Tulsa Artist Fellowship. Um, I, I really see the Tulsa Artist Fellowship supporting local Native writers mm -hmm. and Native writers across the United States, but sure. specifically here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And that's so critical and so important. And um, that's why I, I, I'm honored to, to serve on the committee and really appreciate any efforts to support local right. writers here. Well, let's keep talking about yes. this opportunity. <laughs> and I'm so glad you had the time yes. to come talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you for watching Words on Air.